Hello and welcome to the fourth of our Discover SLM Talks. I particularly want to extend a warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. My name is Nerida Campbell and I am the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we will be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. So keep an eye out for future talks about your favourite subject or for the incurably curious. Tune in every Tuesday at 12 till 12.30 for a new topic. There will be time for questions at the end of each talk. Just add them to the Zoom chat. Today's speaker is Michael Leck, who is a curator at Sydney Living Museums with special responsibility for the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection. Michael curated the exhibition Marion Hall Best, Interiors, and co-curated with Megan Martin, Dream Home, Small Home, on Australia's housing crisis following World War II. Michael has written and presented on various aspects of the history of houses, interiors, and domestic furnishings in Australia including authoring a book on the extensive wallpaper collection at the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection. He's also engaged in ongoing research into the rise and development of Australia's department stores and furnishing trade. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Nerida, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for this talk. I'll just share my screen now, so just, um, Wait a moment and we can get started. Okay. So um, this is a story about some columns from a place called Burdekin House. 180 year old columns that have had a rough life enduring two demolitions and several changes of ownership. The story begins when 10 columns were made to adorn the front veranda of Burdekin House, a grand three-storey house in Macquarie Street, Sydney, built in 1841 for wealthy merchant Thomas Burdekin. Burdekin House was probably designed by the Scottish-born architect James Hume, but no matter who designed it, when the house was near completion in August 1841, the Sydney Herald pronounced it the most handsome house in Sydney. And many years later in the 20th century, architectural historian Morton Herman wrote that the house was superbly built and beautifully finished, making it the finest building in the Regency style in New South Wales. This is a recent photo of one of the columns showing its age, a bit worn, pieces missing and we'll find out why as the story goes on. Uh, the columns, like many of the other elements of the house, were handmade, in this case of timber, and the columns are fluted, the diameter smaller at the top, fanning out slightly as you go down to the base, and with an ionic style capital. The columns were constructed in parts and then attached the main section of the column being built up in staves and almost seamlessly jointed. And the red lines that I've drawn in here show where the joins are. Thomas Burdekin lived to enjoy his house for only a few brief years really before his death in 1844. The house then passed first to his wife, Mary, and later to his son, Sidney Burdekin who was a city councillor, the Lord Mayor of Sydney in 1890-91, and a member of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly for about 10 years from 1884. During this time, the drawing room of Burdington House, which was located directly across the road from the New South Wales Parliament House in Macquarie Street, was often used as a substitute venue for parliamentary party meetings. 
the drawing room of Burdigan House was a notable space for entertaining throughout uh, the Burdigan ownership. It ran the depth, the full depth of the house and was known for its elaborate Rococo interior. Most remarkable were the extravagant painted ceilings and walls, white onyx fireplaces and overmantels with painted cherubs. Burdekin House was owned and occupied by members of the Burdekin family until 1922, and at that point was put on sale. And its fate was questioned for the first time. Many articles appeared in newspapers asking what was going to happen next. The Royal Australian Historical Society lobbied the New South Wales government unsuccessfully to acquire the house for preservation. Instead, the house was bought by Sydney businessman and philanthropist T.E. Roth. The back courtyard and the grand spaces on the ground floor were given over uh, for charities to the uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital Ladies Auxiliary. And the upstairs rooms were let as studios for artists. In this period, the house began to be celebrated more widely, appearing in booklets and tourist brochures as one of the sites of Sydney. Artists also found something to like about the place, as it was the subject for a number of works. And here are three examples uh, from Portia Geach, Sydney or Smith, and Roy de Maestra, uh, who has painted the courtyard. And archit architects, of course, took notice of the building as well. It was a long held practice for young or student aspiring architects to produce measured drawings of admired architecture in order to learn from the masters. In Sydney, Burdekin House became the focus for architecture, architecture students. And from this set of drawings, this is one from a set by, by student Clarence Allen, we see uh, the intricate detail he's gone into and we know from his drawings that the Burdekin House columns included, uh, the Burdekin House columns were precisely 13 feet, one and a half inches in length, which is almost exactly four meters. But changes to Sydney city were afoot including a proposal in 1927 to extend the length of Martin Place to create a significant civic space in the city. Previously, Martin Place had only existed at the lower level, George Pitt, Castle Ray Streets. The new proposal would see it extended all the way up to Macquarie Street. In this plan, the red lines represent the proposed new shape of Martin Place. As you're probably uh, deducing at this time, the problem with this proposal was, of course, that many buildings had to be demolished in Elizabeth, Philip, and Macquarie Streets, including the Old St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church in Philip Street. This is a wonderful photograph showing the demolition of some of those buildings uh, taking place uh, to forge Martin Place. And the photograph has been taken from Macquarie Street, looking down. Uh, the arrow points to the spire of the old St. Stephen's Ch Presbyterian Church. So the church was looking for a new home. And in 1933, Burdekin House went on sale once again. St. Stephen's uh, Presbyterian Church thought this was an opportunity bought Burdekin House and proposed to demolish Burdekin House for the new church. Again, there was considerable discussion in the newspapers about the fate of Burdekin House and how it might be spared from demolition. Maybe it could be a museum, a community centre, a house for the Premier of New South Wales, but it was all to no avail. When demolition became more likely, a number of valedictory articles and photographs were published in newspapers and magazines. There are two here, one, one from the Women's Weekly, one from the Herald. And there's also a photograph of uh, the New St. Stephen's Church as it looks more recently. 
What is interesting is that once the house was demolished, parts of, the, of this house were carefully dismantled and sold off. It wasn't just all turned to rubble. Many Sydney, Sydney siders seemingly attracted to either the fine craftsmanship and or feelings about the importance of the house queued up to buy a piece of Burdekin history. Sorry about that. The Sydney Mail reported in August 1933, during the demolition process, that in the drawing room, workmen are cutting out portions of the painted ceiling. These happily are to be preserved. Unfortunately, the fate of the painted ceilings is a mystery, but other elements are known to have been acquired and reused sometimes in other houses. Burdekin descendants, for instance, uh, Burdekin family descendants, for instance, bought um, uh, the door fan light, side lights, front door, and uh, installed them into a, uh, a country property in northwest New South Wales. Um, most important uh, for, for our story is that six of the 10 columns of, on the front veranda were acquired by the owner of a house in Hunters Hill called St Marlowe. And we'll come back to that in a moment. For the government of the day, the widening of McMartin Place was just the beginning of a city beautification project. There were a number of proposals in the 1930s to create much grander, perhaps grandiose buildings along Macquarie Street that would mean demolishing many of our now most admired, bu admired buildings, including the Mint and Hyde Park Barracks. The artist, Gayfield Shaw, produced a series of illustrations of historic buildings for the Sydney Telegraph entitled Vanishing Landmarks of Sydney. And this included Burdekin House. And here's one of the Mint. As much by good fortune as good management, these projects did not proceed. And here are a number of newspaper reports of the time showing some of the proposals. But the demolition of Burdekin House had another effect. It was an important moment in, an, in awakening the interest of a number of Sydney siders to the fate of our older buildings. Professor Leslie Wilkinson, who was the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Sydney, was one person who advocated loudly for some of our older, more significant historic places. He said that Burdekin, he said that uh, Macquarie Street used to be a beautiful street. Burdekin House was a stately feature of it, and the demolition of that historic building was a crime and a tragedy. Annie White, who would be instrumental in establishing the National Trust in New South Wales to advocate for the built and national, the natural environment, also cited Burdekin House as one of the turning points for her in her drive to protect New South Wales' significant historic buildings. So the Burdekin House columns went to St Marlowe at Hunters Hill. St Marlowe was built around 1856. And it was just one of a number of cottages constructed in Hunters Hill by brothers Jules and Didier Joubert in the 19th century. It became Didier Joubert's own home and the columns were purchased in 1933 by Joubert's daughter, Madame Rose Dubois. Here's a, an image of, from a newspaper article showing uh, Madame Rose de Bois. Once, and once acquired for St. Marlowe, there was a problem though. They didn't exactly fit. They were too tall. So the columns were cut down and replaced the existing cast iron flat grill, flat grill veranda columns on the front of the house. In order to do this, they were reduced from approximately three, to, from approximately four metres to three metres in height. Architectural historian Robin Boyd observed that the result produced somewhat stumpy new proportions. So I'll let you give your own opinion on that. After World War II, Sydney's urban development gathered pace as car ownership increased and population moved further west into newly subdivided suburbs. 
The government now began to build more infrastructure, including roads. And in the late 1940s, a new expressway through Hunters Hill was proposed with bridges at Fig Tree and Gladesville. As a result, St Marlowe and a number of neighbouring properties came under threat of demolition. The Burdekin House co columns couldn't take a trick. A debate then ensued about the fate of St Marlowe and neighbouring properties, which lasted over 10 years. Could the road be moved? Could the properties be moved? Do we, do we really need a new bridge? Do we need an expressway? In an attempt to ensure the long-term survival of St Marlowe, the National Trust even acquired a 20-year lease on the property. Cartoonist George Molnar made a comment about the ongoing saga of whether St Marlowe could be preserved with his cartoon. But if we demolish the pub instead, won't we be accused of acting against Australian tradition? And in his cartoon, Hunters Hill Hotel is on the left and St Marlowe is on the right. But despite significant community and National Trust protest, St Marlowe was demolished in June 1961, together with several neighbouring historic properties as well. You can see this image from the, the Herald from 1961 showing the uh, Fig Tree Bridge under construction with St Marlowe directly in the path. Around this time in the late 50s and early 60s, a number of uh, historic buildings across Sydney came under threat and some significant ones like um, Subiaco at Rydalmere and Bungarabi at Doonside were demolished. It led some people to question how historic buildings might be preserved into the future. It seemed that too many historic places were facing the wrecking ball. According to some pundits, salvage historic materials from these de demolished buildings was one of the only ways to preserve their memory into the future. And some of this material might even be reused in other historic buildings. Again, cartoonist George Molnar produced his view of the situation. In this cartoon, as uh, the man with the hat walks off with the column, he says, but officer, I'm taking home this piece of national heritage to preserve it. So the poor police officer was of course quite confused about this as it seemed uh, theft and vandalism now passed for an accepted way to preserve our historic places. If there was an upside to the demolition of St Marlowe and other buildings, it was that the publicity generated by the campaigns again resulted in a strengthening of public opinion in support of preservation of the built environment. The National Trust's Historic Building Committee began identifying and listing buildings of heritage significance. Community associations also emerged in Sydney concerned with, concerned with preservation of their local historic areas. The Paddington Society, Glebe Society and the Hunters Hill Historical Society were all formed in the early to mid 1960s. The latter, the latter in direct response to the demolition of St Marlowe. But what happened to the Burdekin House columns or the St Marlowe columns? Following the demolition of St Marlowe in 1961, a number of fittings and fixtures were again purchased by private individuals and repurposed into other houses. And the National Trust of Australia and New South Wales decided to retain the six veranda columns originally from Burdekin House. The following year, the National Trust donated two of the columns to the Scone Community Amateur Dramatic Society to be placed either side of the stage of their refurbished theatre in the old courthouse at Scone, New South Wales. And this is the front page you're seeing from the Scone Advocate, June 1962, in between articles on hunter beef cattle prices and a body found in the river is a historic moment that the Burdekin House columns appear on the stage 
at scone for the first time. So there were four remaining columns and these were kept in storage for many years until in uh, 2012, these columns, only one with a surviving capital and base were acquired by Sydney Living Museums. Two of the columns, as well as uh, architectural salvage from other historic buildings, have found a resting place on display at the Museum's Discovery Centre, Castle Hill. The, the display helps to tell some of the stories of Burdekin House in Samawa and will ensure their preservation for the future. However, the salvage material at the Museum's Discovery Centre also serves to remind us that these remnants are out of place. Their original purpose no longer exists. And hopefully it, would, it will raise some questions about how we have treated and perhaps continue to treat our significant horror, historic places in Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That was fascinating. I could ask you a question of my own. Um, where are the Burdekin House columns now? Do we know? Well, uh, the uh, Sydney Living Museum owns four of them and two are on display uh, at Castle Hill. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're all in lockdown, so we can't physically see them. Though there is, uh, uh, you can see some images online. Um, uh, but the other six are unknown. Uh, the two that were at the Scone uh, Dramatic Historic, uh, the Scone Theatre, um, I believe that they, they may still be there, but I'm not sure. The other four that were originally at Burdekin House, it's really unknown. And if anyone in the audience knows where they are, I would love to hear from them. I'm sure you would. Um... Yes. We have a question from Katie. Um, where's the best place to find out more about Burdekin House? Um, the, um, uh, there is uh, some, some information on the Sydney Living Museum's website about Burdekin House. And there's also some, uh, some information on uh, the same uh, Sydney Living Museum site about some of the other architectural uh, remnant material that from other historic properties um, uh, and a bit about the history, a bit more than what I've said, uh, a bit about um, uh, lots more images to, to, to look at. What kinds of um, archives and places do you go to to do the kind of research you do into historic properties and fabrics? Some of the resources people might tap into. Well, uh, <laughs> The best place is where I work, I think, and that is uh, Carolyn Simpson Library and Research Collection. Uh, I think um, we have a wonderful collection relating to the history of our built environment, particularly homes, uh, houses, um, interiors, uh, gardens and so on. Um, but um, there are some wonderful resources at other places. Um, uh, the major uh, libraries like State Library of New South Wales, um, State Records has uh, really good good uh, resources as well about uh, government um, decisions on uh, and uh, bodies like the uh, uh, the Cumberland Cumberland County Council, which was a, a, a body set up by the New South Wales government one time to help plan Sydney's future after World War II. Fantastic. We've got a few more questions coming in. Mm. Uh, Gabrielle would like to know, do you know what timber the columns were made from and were they made in Australia? Uh, definitely made in Australia. They're made um, a lot in that period. Often things were made on site or near site. Uh, the, the fact that they're made up in staves, in pieces, suggests that they didn't have to be made on site, but I think they would have been made near, nearby. Um, there is a complication with the the, um, uh, the the type of timber. We we believe it was a type of Australian hardwood that was um, was used. We're not sure of the exact um, type of hardwood. Okay, we've got more questions about columns construction. Uh, Marie would like to know. You mentioned that the shafts of the columns were constructed in pieces and then put together. 
are the horizontal joints visible on the ones that SLM holds? Um, the the ver vertical um, staves are, uh, are visible and the, um, uh, there's also joins for the base and also the capital at the top of the column. You can see where it's all bits and pieces have been put together. Um, so it wasn't like, <laughs> as you might do now, if you had, um, you know, a computer system, you could sort of all design it in, in, uh, to, to, in one piece. Whereas in those times it was quite common to build things up in, by parts or in parts. Another question, this one's from Scott. Can you tell us anything about the exhibition of antiques held at Burdekin House? Uh, yes, thank you, Scott. Uh, there was a really significant exhibition in 1929. So it was four years before the house was demolished. Um, and the idea of the exhibition was to showcase um, uh, furnishings and decorative arts in, in, uh, in Australia, not necessarily all Australian made, but uh, things that were here in Australia. And so the, the bottom um, floor, or the ground floor, I should say, of Burdekin House was turned over to um, period rooms, historic rooms. So they'd have a Georgian room and a Victorian room and all this. And then the top floor was turned over into modern rooms. And uh, it was really interesting. Some of the um, uh, uh, into um, some artists of the period, like uh, Hera Roberts and Thea Proctor, designed the interiors of some of those rooms. Um, and the uh, and those rooms, those modern rooms, have become quite celebrated um, as a kind of foundation point, in a way, for modernism in Australia and um, many say that modernism uh, in Australia was introduced more through things like um, historic furnishings and interior design rather than through art um, and it was art that sort of came after it. Wow, such a fascinating history. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, Michael would like to know did the columns actually hold anything or were they just decorative? Uh, well, they're, they're principally decorative. I mean, um, they, they didn't really hold anything, just the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't, they weren't structural in that sense, yeah. And Julie would not like to know, are there illustrations in our beautiful houses of Burdekin House? Well, that's a good question. There are indeed, and there are some more of the interiors, which are, as you probably saw from the, the talk, I showed one slide of the elaborate Rococo interior. There's more in the um, Our Beautiful Homes. It's really, um, uh, because Birdingham House was one of the, uh, considered one of the most important houses in Sydney at the, at the time, it's, um, it's no surprise that it appears in that, that book. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Next week's talk is going to be on the mythology of the Grand Tour, and I hope that you can join us again at 12 o'clock then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.